The Blended Video Series is based on an excellent sermon series entitled Blended, presented by Pastor Lance Lowell of Neighborhood Church in Modesto, California. This sermon series is a call for unity in the body of Christ. The theme of this video series is found in the Gospel of John. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Pastor Lowell gave me his sermon notes and encouraged me to design a video series. The episodes that you will see are a collaboration between Pastor Lowell and myself. I hope you enjoy this production. Our mission at Neighborhood Church is to experience Jesus, engage in growth, and employ the love of God. But we can only fulfill this mission when we walk together in true fellowship and abide in unity. The prayer that Jesus prayed on his way to Gethsemane clearly teaches that our testimony to the world is closely linked to our being one, united in faith and purpose. When we present to the world a church that is dysfunctional because of division, then whose testimony is going forth? It surely isn't Jesus. We manifest to the world our selfishness, our pride, our disloyalty and our own self-righteousness. Whose testimony is going forth into the world? It is our own ugly image, not the image of Christ. The disunity we see in the church is infectious. It spreads to our communities, our nation, and the entire world. The divisions we see in our secular society is the result of the church not shining forth the true testimony of Jesus. We are dysfunctional as a nation because our church is dysfunctional as a witness. Consider this thought. How many of us are engaged in relationships with people who see the world completely different than we do. The church preaches messages of unity, but these messages can be tough to live out. This video series is called Blended, but being blended can be difficult. Our local congregations function like blenders. We put different ingredients into our blender, press the button, and with the whoosh of magical spinning blades, our individual ingredients blend together to become a tasty strawberry smoothie. The blending process changes the individual strawberry into a homogenized flavorful drink. Unity in the body of Christ is the delightful drink we enjoy when our local congregations mix the ingredients properly. Do you know what would happen to a blender should an individual strawberry refuse to blend? Something would break. The unyielding strawberry is a perfect metaphor for the attitudes that are common in our local congregations. Generally, 
church people are resistive to the blending process. We engage in fellowship with other people who look like us, think like us, and talk like us. It's hard to have unity when we react this way in the body of Christ. This is why the body of Christ is filled with broken blenders, because unity is hard to live out. Unity is not staying in your lane, hoping to not make anyone mad. Unity is finding the things that can bind us together despite all the differences we have. Once we find the things that bind us together, we build on them until personal care is established. We are not the only ones that struggle with unity. Unity was also a problem for the New Testament church. The Corinthian church was being rocked by eating food sacrificed to idols. This issue caused disunity. Therefore, Paul in his first epistle to the Corinthians gave instructions that could deal with the issue. There are three things taught by Paul that would help the Corinthian church avoid the common pitfalls that lead to disunity. These instructions are also useful today. Always be open to receive a personal conviction, but never try to give your conviction to someone else. Let's read. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who abstains does so to the Lord, and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. This one truth shared by Paul, if put into practice, could have saved the church much blood and pain throughout its history. Imagine accepting a brother or sister on faith alone without engaging in unnecessary debates. What is a disputable matter? Disputable matters are actions and doctrines that have no eternal consequences. They are actions or doctrines that the Bible does not specifically spell out as right or wrong. When we judge members in our congregation based upon disputable matters, 
we allow details of doctrine or action to foster division and disunity. For example, you develop a personal conviction about all types of movies. You believe that any person who goes to a movie is deceived by the devil. You go to church expecting every member in the congregation to accept your personal conviction. Should the congregation not accept your doctrinal position, you judge the church as compromised and ungodly. You now have become an agent of division and disunity. Which is worse, your personal doctrine or the disunity you foster? There is an old cliché from my early days in the church. People tend to major on the minors, but minor on the majors. What does this mean? We make major issues out of minor subjects, while we fail to understand the major issues found in the Bible, such as church unity. The church keeps repeating the same two mistakes over and over again. The church takes issues that are disputable at best and makes them biblical mandates, while the church takes true biblical mandates, such as unity in the body of Christ, and make them disputable issues. A common struggle for most believers is taking a personal conviction and treating it like the Word of God for all people to adhere to. How do we handle these frustrations? It is only in the context of relationship with Jesus can we work out our personal convictions. When we try to navigate an area that is not a mandate in the Bible, we have only one way to work out what is right and wrong, and that is relationship with Jesus our Savior. Some of the issues that stimulate dispute in the church are subjects like dancing, participating in Halloween celebrations, drinking, smoking, music, tattoos, piercings. The list goes on and on. The Bible is largely silent on these issues. Therefore, why do we allow these issues to become disputable matters? The answer is simple. We want our personal convictions to become the convictions of everyone else. When we start to force our personal convictions on other people, we fall into the pit of disunity. Because now we are trying to be the voice of the Lord to someone, and this leads to broken relationship. Paul said in Romans that each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. This means that we need to know what is right for each of us individually because it's our personal conviction. We so often get the cart before the horse. We major on personal conviction but minor on relationship with Jesus. Just remember, your conviction is your conviction. Out of relationship with Jesus, we live out our personal convictions. How do we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ who are different than us? Paul also answered this question in his epistle to Romans. He instructed the Romans to accept them into the faith without passing judgment on disputable matters. The Greek used by Paul in this verse has the application of admitting into friendship or hospitality. 
when new people come among us, let's admit them into friendship and hospitality before we judge based upon personal conviction. The congregation who performs this action the best will reinforce the unity in the church. How important is unity in the church? It is a major biblical mandate that we must adhere to. In fact, Paul admonished the Romans to watch out for the people who cause divisions in their congregations because unity is not their primary objective. Paul said that these people are not serving Christ, but their own agendas. We must do the same. Be on the lookout for agents of disunity. Don't engage in judgment while not engaging in relationship. Again, the Apostle Paul has something to say. Let's read. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Paul is zeroing in on the priority of relationship. He elevates relationships to the status of biblical mandate. We are to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility we are to consider others better than ourselves. Paul was stern when he asked the Romans why they were judging their brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a serious thing to judge your brother or sister in Christ because we all appear before the judgment seat of God. It is also a serious thing to look down on your brother or sister in Christ. Consider for a moment the pride and vain conceit that festers in our hearts when we look on other members of our congregation with condescension. Jesus also taught that before we attempt to remove the speck of sawdust from our brother's eye, we first must pay attention to the plank in our own eye. Before we attempt to judge our brothers and sisters in Christ, we first must allow righteous judgment to gaze into our own hearts. Should we ever look at our brother or sister in Christ with a judgmental eye? Paul does not support this concept. Paul admonished the Galatians that should they catch a brother in sin, then those who are spiritual should gently work to restore him to the faith. But the Galatians were to watch their own hearts, lest they be carried away with the same sin. Do you think this type of restoration occurs without some form of judgment? It does not. But this type of judgment must be filtered through relationship. We should never judge our brothers and sisters in Christ without engaging in relationship with them. We must have relationship first, then out of a loving relationship, judgment and restoration can flow. We are to accept one another 
just as Christ accepts us. The unity we produce brings praise to God. Before we invest ourselves in judgment, first invest in relationship, because relationship builds unity in the body of Christ. Remember, traditions that hold no true lasting value should not be allowed to hinder relationship with God and others. Let us, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So, whatever you believe about these things, Keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. What are traditions? According to Webster's Dictionary, traditions are an inherited, established, or customary pattern of thought, action, or behavior, such as a religious practice or a social custom. It is the handing down of information, beliefs, and customs by word of mouth or by example from one generation to another without written instructions. During the days of Jesus, the concept of tradition had a significant meaning to the Jews. In Jewish theology, the tradition of the elders was the oral teachings of distinguished rabbinical ancestors who sought to interpret the Torah. The Jews revered these traditions equally with the written Word of God and were regarded equally authoritative on matters of belief and conduct. It was these traditions that Jesus spoke against to the scribes and Pharisees. The Pharisees often charged Jesus with violating these traditions. But Jesus would retort that they allowed their traditions to nullify the Word of God. Why would traditions be considered a pitfall to church unity? Have you ever heard the expression, but we've always done it this way? This expression is a major stumbling block to the new things the Holy Spirit is doing in the body of Christ. Is it possible that our old traditions could frustrate the work of the Holy Spirit? The answer to this question is a resounding yes. Because of our traditions, we frustrate the work of unity in the body of Christ. Pastor can only preach traditional messages because we always do it this way. We resist new forms of worship because we always do it this way. Dear God, we cannot have worship dance in the church because we all know that dance is of the devil. Should, but we always do it this way, be your mantra then consider the possibility your 
frustrating the new thing God is doing in your midst. What should our response be to our traditions? Just remember that they are our traditions. Not everyone has been raised with your traditions. Paul instructed the Romans to make every effort to work towards peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of our traditions. So, what you believe about your traditions, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man or woman who does not condemn him or herself by what he or she approves. The church is often a battleground for competing traditions. Differing points of view can collide, and often generations separate these traditions. Harm to church unity and relationship can also occur when people attempt to establish new traditions that resist the homeostasis of local congregations. The point Paul is making is that traditions have no value if they hinder relationship with God or others. Never let your traditions interfere with relationship and building the body of Christ. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So, you want to walk in God's blessing. Then, you must walk in unity with the brethren. God's blessing is found in the center of unity. The more we work toward unity in our congregation, the more we will enjoy God's blessing. Just remember, the kingdom of God is built on relationships. When you walk through the doors of Neighborhood Church, please be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace.